Um, I think collectively, uh, I did not hear, I did not hear the full fledged justification of the precautionary principle, and I think that focusing on the fact that its application would be the greatest good for the greatest number of people is probably manifestly wrong. Because I think there are plenty of instances where being precautionary means that you you look out for subgroups or sub-effects, which in fact are very unlikely. In a world of certainty, one can argue the utilitarian ethics applies. That is, you have if you ban a chemical, you're going to have a certain cost and you're going to have a certain benefit. Uh, as soon as the cost becomes uncertain or the benefit becomes uncertain, which is related to risk assessment because the benefit of controlling the chemical is derived from doing some sort of risk assessment which has high uncertainties in it. But it's not the only thing that has uncertainties. Costs have uncertainties too. So as soon as you depart from a well-defined benefit and a well-defined cost, utilitarian ethics is no longer important because what's important is what, how you value the mistakes that you could make. A type 1 error comes when you fail to regulate something and it later turns out to be worse than you thought or at the tails of the distribution of what you think. And a type 2 error is where you regulate and things turn out to be not as bad as you thought and impose a higher cost upon. But um, th there's a type 3 error, which is you're working on the wrong problem. And I think that's what you all really missed. The point is that when you ban a chemical, you don't ju that isn't all that happens. What happens is you, you end up coming face to face with a substitute, with an alternative technology, with alternative ways to meet the public needs. And so a straight cost-benefit analysis, even with uncertainty, unless it includes the alternatives that you have, is not a complete analysis. And you can make anything look good depending upon how you value life or value the environment. And so the precautionary principle <clears throat> properly uh, which, is, which applies when you have great uncertainties, has to ask the question, what are the alternatives to the action that you've decided to, to, to promote? And, you know, there are alternatives, there are substitutes. Um, I'll give you one more, one more comment in that. I know the work of Cass Sunstein well. He and I graduated from the Lane, same law school. I think he is a poor scholar, because I think he does not you, understand. You heard it here. <laughs> he does, does not really understand what, what, what this whole issue is about, has never, has never really uh, understood it. Uh, for example, I mean, people say, well, suppose you, you, you regulate vinyl chloride. You put worker controls on vinyl chloride, and the workers <coughs> now earn a smaller salary because the vinyl chloride producer can't afford to pay them. So what do they do? They quit their health clubs, they buy less lean hamburger, and the health impact, it is argued by, by Sunstein, is worse than if you regulated the hazard because you've made the workers poorer and they eat fatty hamburger and don't exercise. But that doesn't take into account the fact that when you regulate vinyl chloride, what replaces it, let's say, is polyethylene. So those industries increase production, increase the wages of their workers who now join health clubs and eat lean hamburger. Now, if you're really going to take this calculus to the extreme, you can see how ridiculous it is because you, you can't really determine. But what you can determine and what regulation has shown is when it's stringent, you don't make marginal changes in production. You make serious shifts in the nature of industrial policy and you shift to non-chemical alternatives, for example, the banning of CFCs didn't just supply one inhalant, which was slightly better, but people started to use pump cans. You sell less product, and that's too bad for the producer, but you don't need an inhalant to deliver deodorant or those things. So what it, it is narrowly defined. You work on the wrong problem, and you ignore uh, how you feel about error avoidance. That's where the precautionary principle comes in. Beautiful. Go along with it, slash, um, sort of bring up that point that I think there is a middle ground where, um, with some things, I think we should look into alternatives and sort of have them as back seat. Like, if we find that, like, whatever precautionary action didn't work out, I think 
it's really dangerous to just like ignore other alternatives. Yeah. If, like be like the Sustain article um, said, like <coughs> going with that action leads to you know unintended things that maybe could have been a benefit. You know, take take the global warming situation. You know, this middle ground I think is a, is a fiction. You either have to regard the probability of serious global impacts as as within the realm of possibility, or you don't. And and you even people who don't aren't certain about the science. You ask them the question: Should we plan for rising sea level? Should we plan for floods and drafts? Would it be a bad thing to do? And the answer invariably comes, no, it would be a good thing to do. And if you, have, if you act in a timely fashion, even if you turn out to be wrong, you have, imagine what would happen if you turned out to be right, and you turned out to have the coastal cities disappear in Indonesia, like in the, like in the sea. I think the precaution principle has been criticized by people who have an economic horse dog in that fight, that it's too expensive and their particular industry will disappear. But the alternative, is to have generally other people bear the cost. So who bears the cost and who reaps the benefit of the decided policy is very important. And the distributional effects of going one way or the other are really serious. I mean, if you decide to put a carbon tax on oil, let me tell you, the petroleum industry will survive. The petroleum industry, if you don't put a carbon tax on the oil, it's not clear that the planet will survive. So you have to ask, Whose ox is being gored? <laughs> How certain are we that, 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 that you are producing an irreducible effect on these people? And, and do you want to keep your options open? So I reject the fact that what you're trying to do is find a middle ground. Right? Finally. But I want to turn the dial as a, as a last note. One more uh, tick beyond what Nick just said. Um, I believe that, take the climate change example, that if you say, let's take this seriously, because it might happen, that a whole series of second and third order decisions can get made that in fact wouldn't get made otherwise. It's related to the point you're making first. Uh, and that that will create all kinds of benefits because people won't do it to create disbenefits, they'll do it to create benefits. But they never would have searched, they never would have tried, they never would have looked there. So when we talk to communities about taking um, various moves to manage potential climate risks, we say, and why don't you do it in a way that creates all kinds of other second and third order benefits now, instead of just looking at what the costs are and arguing that the long term benefits outweigh the short term costs. My argument is, why don't you try to do something that deals with those risks and creates all kinds of short term benefits, and that becomes a design consideration in formulating the policy. And if you can't do it, you can't do it. But I would argue that the problem with the precautionary principle is it doesn't for, it doesn't link to and let's look at ways of using this period that we're not going to do something. The, I told you the story about the Central Arctic and the fisheries question, you can use a period of time to do more scientific investigation that might in fact lead us to understand better ways of using those resources as opposed to, oh my god, we're scared. A bad thing could happen. There might only be a 1% chance, but oh my god, if it happens, horrible, horrible things will affect us in the future, so let's not do it. Yeah, but the precautionary principle has been linked to alternatives analysis now. Nobody doesn't ask what are the alternatives. And by the way, the big failure Bush and Cheney decided we're going to get Saddam before he get us. He was operating under precautionary principle. Look what the application of that precautionary <coughs> principle brought us. Right. But if you if you only say, let's look at alternatives, that's not the same as let's search for alternatives right. that both reduce the risk and create a variety and of benefits. And develop those alternatives. And let's be clear about trying to distribute the benefits of those alternatives in a progressive way. You could add that too. Right. Anyway, thank you both for coming. Thank you very much. Thanks to the presenters.